Mason, we're so happy to have you here uh, presenting to the Fossil Club. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. I'll switch my screen over now. Get there. Present. All right, so uh, again, thanks everybody for being here. I'm very happy to be here uh, talking to you guys. Um, and we're gonna be talking about uh, Carcharicles megalodon, the largest shark to ever live. Um, and we're gonna kind of see how that came to be. So first we gotta start out before we head on our journey. We gotta know what a species even really is. Um, and the problem with species is that they're really artificial. Um, humans came up with them and so they're not always perfect, unfortunately. Uh, so, change this up real quick. Um, because, uh, because species are human labels, they don't always work. There's two different species concepts that are most often used in biology. The first is gonna be the biological species concept, which is if two things can uh, create fertile offspring together, then they are part of the same species. Um, that doesn't always pan out in the real world and especially not in the fossil record where we cannot uh, breed animals that have been dead for many millions of years. So we use the morphological species concept, which is basically scientists come together and they write a species description that says this animal has this character and this character and this character to establish a range of variation between them. Um, unfortunately, this makes it incredibly arbitrary. What you think should be a species is completely different than what I think should be a species or a genus or an order or a family or whatever. Um, so there's kind of been two camps that have developed First is called the splitters, and the next, the next is called the lumpers. Uh, the splitters uh, support creating species on very minor differences. Uh, so where someone else might see one species, they can see three based on very slight differences. Uh, and then there's lumpers, which support a very broad range of species, uh, or range of variation within a species. So they're gonna advocate much less uh, species within a genus and much, genus within a, much less genus within a family. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to take a more splitter approach uh, because you guys are mostly fossil hunters and fossil collectors. And I want to tell you how to A, identify your teeth and B, um, know what you're, what's on the label you're reading. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I have a loaf of bread here because I believe the saying comes from uh, David Ward, but uh, with Carcharicles and with many other uh, species, we have been basically handed a loaf of bread by nature. Um, we have this range from one species to the next with no clear lines in between and uh, nature tells us how to, and we decide how to slice it. So um, David Ward likes to say, how many slices can you get out of a loaf of bread? Um, and that's as many as you want. Next, we're going to need to know a little bit about tar uh, shark tooth anatomy. Um, this is one half of a jaw. Uh, so this continues on the other side. Sharks uh, are heterodont, in me or at least many sharks are, meaning they have different types of teeth at different positions in the mouth. Uh, the ones in the front are called the anterior teeth. Uh, the ones on the side are called laterals. In Carcharicles, we don't have any intermediate teeth. Um, and in the back, we have posterior teeth. Um, in between, sometimes they're called lateral posterior, or in between here, they might be called anterior lateral. So uh, just whatever you need to use. Symphysial teeth are teeth at the exact midline of the mouth. There's also parasymphysials, which are right next to the midline. Um, Megalodon has symphysial teeth. Uh, it was debated for a long time, but has now been soundly proven. Next, we need to know what a tooth actually looks like. Uh, this is called a crown, although sometimes I like to call it a blade. I don't know why, that's just my term. Uh, but that's the big uh, part in the middle. These, the little, Things on the side are called serrations, just like you'd have serrations on a knife. Um, the big bulbous bottom part is called the root, and the sides are the root lobes. Um, so I'll be referring to those. These are cusps, or some people prefer to call them cusplets. When I talk about cusplets, I'm talking about smaller cusps or vestigial cusps. Um, and when I'm talking about cusps, I'm talking about big, prominent, uh, little enamel shoulders on the side. Um, this is the enamel band. Uh, which is something oop, that's very uh, important for, the, what, for this talk, especially because this has, these species have a very prominent dental band. Um, by collectors, it's often called a burlet. Um, uh, so that's what that is. That's actually an uh, a attachment point for ligaments. 
Um, so as bite force increases, that's going to get bigger because they need more ligaments to keep holding it in place because unfortunately the, the root part doesn't really connect very well to the jaw in sharks uh, because they like to move their teeth into a different position when they bite. We're going to start our journey here with a, kind of an underdog, just like many other sharks of its time. This shark first arises um, in the mid-Cretaceous, uh, about around 100 million years ago is when the um, when Cretolamna, the genus, begins. Uh, this is Cretolamna appendiculata, depending on your definition of what that means, uh, that starts sometime in the late Cretaceous. Um, the Cretaceous is actually a lot bigger than it appears down here. Um, but much like many other sharks during its time period, uh, it's within one to two inch range typically. It's got three cusps. This is called a grasping type dentition. Um, and the reason for uh, this design is because it's very good for biting fish. Um, the name is Cretaceous lamna. Lamna means mackerel shark, which these are everything we're going to talk about is a mackerel shark. Um, so it's a Cretaceous lamna shark. And appendiculata uh, means wide appendages, which is in reference to the root, uh, which is, as you can see, has a very nice big wide U in the bottom, has these very rounded root lobes. Um, and then it's got uh, these nice triangular cusps and it's kind of uh, gracile, meaning uh, it's the opposite of robust, it's kind of thin, um, which is going to be uh, important to distinguish it from the next species. I also want to tell you, this is actually contrary to popular belief the flat side, this side, is the front, is the tooth, the part of the tooth you would see if you saw the shark open its mouth. This is called the labial side, uh, so the lip facing side. Um, this side is called the lingual side, meaning facing the tongue. Um, so you wouldn't see this part, although a lot of collectors call this the display side um, because it, it kind of looks nicer in pink, according to some people. But uh, this shark only gets from one to two inches which, uh, and it's been, it's been estimated to be at around, uh, to top out around two meters in length, um, which is about, uh, what, I think like 16 feet-ish, um, which uh, is because it's not alone here. In the Cretaceous Oceans, uh, this is when the dinosaurs were walking on land, uh, we also had giant sea reptiles like mosasaurs, um, and they were gonna take the apex predator uh, position in the Cretaceous Seas, so most sharks during this time were very uh, small, or at least smaller, 16 feet is kind of big, but uh, certainly not the proportions that we're gonna see later. So time goes on, the dinosaurs die, a uh, giant meteor comes down and hits the earth. And along with the non-avian dinosaurs, mosasaurs die too. And so then, uh, oh, first I wanna show you, this. this is a posterior of the same species. Um, these are both in my collection, they're from Morocco. You can also find these in Maryland. Uh, they actually have a very long, uh, long time alive, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, after the dinosaurs die, that apex predator role in the ocean is finally opened up. So we have Ototus obliquus arises, maybe in the late Cretaceous, but definitely by the Paleocene. Um, Ototus obliquus is much more robust. It's got this wide, thick blade, this wide, thick crown, um, and these, though, in, when they're smaller, can be very difficult to distinguish from Cretolamna. Uh, and Cretolamna has an overlap period here um, with it, although it may be a slightly different species. Uh, it's not been adequately described yet. But um, when they're smaller, they can be really hard to tell from, uh, from Cretolamna. So for your collectors, this is probably the best identification tip that I'm going to have. Um, when you look at Cretolamna, it's the same in this one and in this one, uh, the cusps if you draw a point from here to here, to here to here, it's very flat. There's a flat line between the cusps, a horizontal line that's also in this position. In every position, it's gonna be that way, very flat uh, cusps. Here, you can see they're very diagonal. You draw a line from here to here, and then from here to here, that's a very curved line because these are, these are sat on a diagonal edge. So that's how you're gonna tell Ototus apart from, uh, from Cretolamna. Ototus means ear tooth, uh, which I believe is a reference to the shape of the bottom of the tooth, which according to, to the person who named it, Agassiz, um, it looked like a ear. Um, I don't think it does, but I didn't name the species, unfortunately. 
Um, Oblicus is because it's kind of oblique. Um, Agassiz named a lot of different sharks. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, these parentheses at the side uh, mean that it wasn't named in the same genus that it's in now. So uh, he named it in Lamna. He basically named anything with a blade and two cusps Lamna, which is today uh, the living salmon shark and poor beagle shark, if you know your sharks. Um, but this guy lived in the Paleocene about 65 million years ago, all the way up to the middle of the Eocene um, about 41 million years ago, maybe a little before that, uh, probably more a little before that. Back to the same tooth. This is David Hoppy's tooth. He's on the watching today. Uh, thank you for this tooth. It's from the Acquia Formation on the Potomac River. You can definitely find these in Maryland um, at Perth State Park or at uh, Douglas Point. Um, Credilamna are also there, uh, a little bit rare. Um, they can also, both of these can be found in the Nanjamoy Formation of Maryland and also Virginia. Um, it's a little harder to access though. Nanjamoy Formation is Eocene. Next, we get Ototus Mogadzaricus, which is a mouthful of a name. Uh, Mogadzar is just the hills from where it was described. And when this was described by Itzelesco in 1999, um, he described it as Ototus var, meaning variety or variation, Mogadzaricus, um, because it's really, or he described it as Ototus obliquus var, Mogadzaricus, because in many respects, it's exactly the same as Ototus. Um, except, as you can see here, we have some jagged edges showing on the cusps and a little bit of wave on the enamel of the, uh, of the crown. And this is going to be an early Eocene, that's the Euprecian age. Um, and it it's exists for a very short period of time. It's only found in a select few places, places like the Nanjamoy Formation of Maryland and Virginia, um, places like Kazakhstan, and also in the London Clay, which is uh, near London, in the Isle of Sheppey, as we can see down here. This is from Daniel Hogburn. Much thanks for the tooth. Um, and that's Eocene of an age as well. Um, they're very rare, they're hard to find, and then there's not many places to have them. So uh, good luck finding, uh, getting one of these teeth in your collection. But if you do, kudos. Um, but uh, they're always labeled if they're being sold as Ototus mogodzarkis as opposed to Ototus obliquus mogodzarkis, and that's just because it's so, um, because it's so, it's much smaller. <laughs> um, this is the uh, labial side, this, or, you know, the lingual side, the side that faces the tongue. Uh, as you can see, it looks just like Ototus, except for the jagged cut. Uh, this is a uh, tooth I collected out of the Nanjamoy Formation of Maryland. Uh, it's Carcharicles axuaticus. It's the next species. If you notice, we've changed genus again from Ototus to Carcharicles. Now, this is very controversial. First of all, because of the lumper splitter thing. But second of all, there's this whole other level, which I'm not really going to get into, but it's called phylogenetics. Um, and it has to do with how species split off and where the name should change. It's a little more empirical. Um, it's a more modern way of thought. Um, but I'm going to use Carcharicles because you're most often going to see the sold as Carcharicles or you're going to see it on labels as Carcharicles. Um, now, you're going to notice a lot of these Kazakh species. This was named by Zalesko, a Russian scientist, and uh, this was named by Menner. And it's also type, uh, spe type location is in Kazakhstan. It's named after a, a village called Aksuat. Um, you're going to see that they're much more splitter, and that's because they have they're blessed in Kazakhstan with a wonderful continuous section of ages of rocks. They have from all the way at the bottom of the Cretaceous, sorry, that's coming up, um, all the way up here to the Oligocene, they have pretty much continuous sediments, which means they can see the very minute, slow changes in the lineage over time. Um, this is also gonna be during the early Eocene from the Euprecian, um, and maybe in a little bit into the middle, that's debatable. The main characters that you're going to see on this, the main features, uh, unfortunately, my, mine has a little cusp broken off and it's a little worn, but it has real serrations, uh, both on the cusp and on uh, the blade. And they go up, if you look about it, uh, they get smaller as they go up and they stop at about two thirds point. Um, and this is going to be common for Carcharicles axuaticus. Anyone with real serrations on the blade from two thirds or from down here, up to about here, I'd call Axuaticus. It's often called a transitional ototus. 
Um, otherwise, it's very Ototus-like in design or, or even Credilamina-like. It's got these nice round lobes and this nice DPU. Um, now, you might be wondering, what are these serrations for? Well, back when we had Ototus mogadzaricus, this was just a pathology. It was just a genetic deformity, um, just like all adaptations start out as. Um, but it turned out that these serrations are good for cutting through flesh, which is important when you're a bigger shark and you're eating larger things. Um, so this turned out to be advantageous, so it was perpetuated. Uh, this is the uh, lingual side. Uh, sorry for the bad picture. Uh, but as you can see, the burlet is also growing. I might say that uh, Ototus gets up to, perhaps in the interiors, which are usually a bit larger, can get up to four inches in extremely rare cases. They're mostly going to hover around the uh, two or three inch mark. Um, and that goes for Ototus mogodzarcus and Carcaricles axuaticus as well. Um, as we head to the next species, uh, this is, by the way, one of the most beautiful teeth I've ever seen. It's from Mark Bennett, um, found in a Virginia River, so probably Piney Point Formation. Carcaricles auriculatus um, is a tooth that has, is defined by having uh, irregular serrations all the way up to the tip. There, you can see, like this one has two serrations on it. This serration is much bigger than this one. They're all different sizes. It's very jagged. Um, this is a tooth that, if you're using the splitter mentality, is limited to a very small period of time between 49 and 41 million years ago, called the Middle Eocene or the Lutetian Age. Um, it's known from across the world in locations of the same age. It's known from Maryland and Virginia, or maybe not Maryland, but definitely Virginia. Um, it's known from Belgium. It's known from Kazakhstan. Uh, it, all of these sharks, it seems, were worldwide, and they were all one species that was slowly changing over time. It's textbook evolution. They call it anagenesis. Um, so this is the front of the tooth, and this is the back of the tooth, uh, lingual side. Um, beautiful tooth. Now we have Carcaricles socolavi, which, and also Otodus posodini, I put them in the same thing. The, to me, these species don't really exist. They're what bridge the gap between the species we just talked about, Carcaricles auriculatus, and Angostidens, which we'll see later, appears in the Oligocene. These teeth have a mix of both traits, and it's kind of variable which one you get. I found that it's sometimes even hard to tell that it is, car that it is a Carcaricles socolavi. I might accidentally, if the colors are not typical of the location, I could totally say, accidentally say that it's one or, one or the other. Um, but the differences uh, between this one and this one is A, you can see these guys have a very fat crown here, a very robust crown. You start to get a little more constricted. And uh, first off, the Russians call these ones from the Artonian time period, Otodus Poseidoni, um, and they call the ones from the Pribonian, um, which is would be this tooth. Uh, Carcaricles socolavi, which is spelled two different ways, unfortunately. I don't know what the type, what the original description said, uh, but it's a V or a W. You can see it either way. Either way, in uh, German, it's pronounced the same. Carcaricles socolavi. Um, call it socolavi or socolavi, and no one's going to be angry at you. Um, it's got much finer serrations on the root, I mean, on the crown. And uh, we're going to still see, though, those jagged serrations on the cusps, which are also going to be strongly outward facing. Um, and this is the classic Carcaricles socolavi. This one comes, by the way, from Sky Renee and Joshua Bassick. Uh, it comes from Harleyville, South Carolina. Uh, you see, whenever you see auriculatus from Harleyville, there depends where it comes from, because that's a larger section of the Eocene. Um, but it's probably Otodus Poseidoni or Carcaricles socolavi. There's some actual auriculatus mixed in. You, they also found them in the Suwannee River down in Florida. Um, the the Dakla Morocco, they find hundreds of Carcaricles socolavi, um, and uh, they have these nice Moroccan colors. Uh, as you can see, we have these very jagged roots. This is my tooth. It's about three inches. Um, they got very much more regular and fine serrations. And uh, then we go to uh, Carcaricles angostidens. 
Procaricles angustidens is incredibly common in the Somerville area of South Carolina. It's also known from all over the world, really. I might actually, I forgot to say, Procaricles sokolavi is the only species Procaricles I know of that's described from um, Antarctica. Uh, all of these sharks, again, are worldwide. Procaricles angustidens, known from across the world, Australia, uh, known from America, known from New Zealand, known from Europe, and not sure if they're known from Africa, just because during the Oligocene, um, the oceans were a little, a uh, little shallower. Um, so there's not as many um, outcrops, but where they do outcrop, this shark is very common. This is gonna be the first very large shark, uh, first really, really large shark. This guy's getting it up to four, five inches, maybe in, in um, in slant height, which is the measurement from here to here, which collectors often use. Um, and it has this very fine regular serrations on both the blade and on the cusps. Now, a development that's happening here in the Oligocene is that a new, uh, new order of animals, Cetacea, is developing. And that's going to be your whales, your dolphins, and your porpoises. Um, and as they become a bigger and bigger thing into the late Oligocene here, they're going to become a primary food source for Carcharicles angustidens. Um, instead of feeding on large fish or maybe other medium-sized sharks, um, they're going to start focusing more on cetaceans, on whales and dolphins, um, which is going to lead to a variety of changes in their teeth to accommodate the diet. When we get into the early Miocene, we see this very well in Carcharicles chubutensis, uh, named after the Chibut uh, province of Argentina, where it's first found. I forgot to say, angustidens just means constricted tooth, um, and that's a reference to this being smaller than um, Otodus auriculata. Uh, so with uh, Carcharicles chubutensis, uh, we can see the tooth has, the blade, the crown, has widened an incredible amount, and that's because the jaw force has increased an incredible amount. Um, this is going to be one of the largest bite forces of any animal ever to live that we know of. Um, and so to spread out that weight more evenly, uh, it's gotten bigger. Uh, if you put it into the small tip of the tooth and it's a very thin tooth, it can break very easily. Um, I've chosen the most perfect teeth for you guys, but most of these teeth are going to have uh, wear on the tip. Um, which is feeding damage, mostly from when these things are going to be chomping into an animal and hit bone and it just flakes off the tip, um, which is what happens when you're A, biting bone, and B, when you have a massive bite force. Second thing is these cusps. Um, I would call these cusplets. These are vestigial cusplets. Uh, they're the remnants of these ones. And uh, they have started to become part of the tooth. Now, uh, and here's the other side. The reason for this is because while these cusps were great back in Credilamna appendiculata when we were eating fish with that grasping type dentition, when you're eating whales and dolphins, it's just a liability. It's a structural flaw. It's much more likely to break this part off or even this corner off. Um, so it's going to start bringing it in to start uh, doing away with that problem. Of course, it's not actively thinking about this and doing this. This is something that happens through random genetic mutation, um, which is passed on over time. Um, and this is going to live in the early Miocene. This is tooth is from Bill P, uh, Bill Prokownik, friend of mine. Um, and this tooth is from Maryland. They're very well known from Maryland. They're very well known from South Carolina and Virginia. Um, it's known from a relatively small amount of time, but because these ocean, the oceans were fairly high. It's represented throughout the world. I think it's also found in maybe Australia, definitely in Europe a lot, in Italy and such. And this is where we start to get to the final iteration, what you've all been, ooh, wait, first forgot to mention. We have chubadons sometimes. And this just kind of illustrates how the lines in between these species are very flimsy. Um, and we're not always sure where one species ends and where another begins. Um, this one's also uh, found by Bill P. at Plum Point, um, Calvert Formation. It's got a well-developed vestigial cusp on one side, but not on the other. Um, and while it's common for younger megs um, to have vestigial cusps sometimes, it's uh, something they grow out of 
as they get bigger. Um, same thing with great white sharks, by the way. Um, on this one, it's notable for having none on one side and one on the other. This one, I'm not sure if it's a pathology or a true cusp, um, but it also has one on one side, none on the other. This is from Willie Tell and Marcus Mel in the Pungo River formation of Lee Creek Mine, uh, which is that big one they used to have down in South Carolina before it got shut down. Um, and then we get where we all been waiting for, Carcharicles megalodon, um, which is going to be known from uh, the early middle Miocene. Uh, specifically, it overtakes uh, Carcharicles chubutensis in, um, in frequency during the Langean period, 14 million years ago. And it's going to live all the way, it's going to live out the rest of the Miocene and survive into the Pliocene until about three and a half million years ago. Unfortunately, uh, it's going to die in the Pliocene. There are Contrary to popular belief, no megs swimming around in the deep oceans today. Um, and the reason for this is probably because uh, also in this late Miocene, early Pliocene time, you have another shark developing, and that's Carcharodon carcarius, um, which is the great white shark. The great white shark has a very similar design to the megalodon, except much smaller. In fact, Carcharicles megalodon used to be put in the genus Carcharodon, um, and sometimes it's put in Procarcharodon. Also, this one and uh, this one are often put in Megasalacious by some European researchers, but uh, it's very similar in, in tooth style and design to the great white shark. But because the great white shark is smaller, it feeds mostly on pinnipeds, seals, um, and on, also on smaller cetaceans and, and whatever. Um, and I might, might add all these sharks are gonna be, they're not just gonna be eating one thing, they're gonna eat what comes to them. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. But when Carcharodon carcarius, the great white shark, becomes, comes on the stage and starts eating all the pinnipeds and all the smaller to medium sized fish and other things, then juvenile Carcharicles megalodon, um, megs, are, have a, basically the whole diet knocked out. You've knocked out a whole developmental stage of megalodon. Now, while this probably isn't the sole reason it went extinct, extinction's a very complicated event, typically. Um, it's gonna be a major driver for their extinction three and a half million years ago. Um, and if they hadn't gone extinct then, they would probably have gone extinct a little later because we have a small extinction event at the end, um, which is gonna wipe out a lot of the uh, dolphins and whales that they were feeding on. Um, but because Carcharodon carcarius is a smaller shark. It's able to live through that and persist to this day. Now, Carcharicles megalodon, this is an associated dentition from uh, that in the possession of Mike Bona, who I believe is here today. Thank you for letting me use your teeth. Um, it's from Indonesia. Um, it's going to have no cusps, very fine serrations, big old triangular tooth with a massive burlet uh, because of the incredible, this is, it is, theorized to have the greatest bite force of all time. It's also the largest shark of all time, probably between 40 and 50 feet. Um, I think it probably got a little higher uh, because it's unlikely that we've found the tooth from the largest one to ever live. The largest one to ever uh, that we have is about, is a little over seven inches in slant height. Um, and the way we're getting these size estimations, by the way, if we don't have an associated shark, uh, we're taking ratios from living great whites because we figure they're probably similar. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Carcharicles megalodon for you. An incredible shark which died too young. Uh, an incredible specialist. And um, that's all I have for you guys uh, today. I want you to just take a, a look back at what we've just accomplished. We've just gone through at least 60 million years. If you count the beginning of Credo Lamina, 100 million years of evolution. We had humble beginnings, most like a ton of other sharks um, at Credilamna got a little bit thicker here and Otodus in the Paleocene became the apex predator. We moved on to Otodus mogodsaricus, uh, which is gonna have these nice jagged cusps and a little bit of uh, ripple on there. It's basically a pathological tooth, um, but this adaptation becomes advantageous. And we move into Carcharicles axuaticus, which is gonna have these Finer, have these actual serrations on both the cusp and the blade. Um, and then here we are at Carcharicles auriculatus, fully serrated, though it's very jagged, um, and a beast of a shark. So we had this kind of first saga to get serrations. And then we start with 
uh, uh, Karkarkles, Poseidon, I, and, um, and Sokolauvi, and Angostidens, which is going to compress the root, uh, really fine out those serrations as we start to have a dependence on whales and dolphins as a diet. It's going to widen out so that it can have a bigger bite force. Uh, it's going to start losing these cusps so that it can specialize even more. And then we have the one specialist species at the end, the one we all know and love, Carcharocles megalodon, uh, a specialist, which always go extinct before generalists, unfortunately. So that's what I have. Uh, if you guys have any questions, if we can open that up, maybe Brown can come back on and tell them to me, or I'll try to open it up and look at it. Um, I'm back and, here. Yeah. Thank you, Mason. That was fascinating. Mm -hmm. No if problem. I hope it was enjoyable and not too boring. Um, and before we start, can I also say thank you for everyone who let me use your teeth, Scott and Joshua Basica of the Pal Palmetto Fossil Excursions. If you're ever down South Carolina and want to go hunting with them, I'd highly recommend it. We've got Daniel Hogburn, Mike Bona, Mark Bennett, David Hoppy, Bill Prokownik, uh, Willie Tell, Mark Smo, and all of the NHSM staff, which were very helpful. So we'll open it up for questions. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and um, send, yeah, talk to Mason directly. There's one question in the chat. Um, it's, would love to hear your opinion on Megalolamna paradoxodon and okay. how it escaped detection. And, and what detection? And how it escaped detection for so long. Ah, okay, so little background for everybody. Megalolamna paradoxon, uh, paradoxodon was named a few years back, maybe, I don't know, three, four years back. Um, and it has those very rounded root lobes um, and that big U in the, in the bottom. So we know that it is an otodontid. And there's actually a few that I uh, didn't get to mention here uh, that kind of split off from otodis or maybe crotolanma beforehand um, and that survive into this time period. Uh, and it's extremely rare. Um, it's known, I think, from South Carolina, one two from South Carolina, one from Peru, and one from Japan, I think. Um, it was likely a pelagic shark. It looks a lot like crotolanma in a lot of ways. It's very gracile and thin, probably lived out in the ocean. And the big question with it is, how did we miss it? Because we have nothing that looks really like an ancestor for millions of years preceding it. It lives in the Miocene. How do we connect that with Cretolamna or with Otodus all the way back um, in the Eocene? That's what, 10, 20 million years of, of ghost lineage is what we call that. Um, and I think I mean, there's two possibilities. It could just be from, we just haven't found the transitionals because we're unlucky because it's pelagic. Uh, and unfortunately sharks, which live in the deep water, don't get preserved as often as ones which live in shallow water just because of the, uh, we live on land and we hunt for fossils on land. Um, I think that another possibility is it could be related to another giant shark called Perototus, um, which is called the false mako shark sometimes by collectors. Um, and I think the the basal forms of Perototus look strikingly like um, like Megalolamna. So I think it may have split off early from there and lived back here. Um, and the reason we haven't found it is just because it's super rare and plagic. That's my answer for that. Hope that, that was good. There's a couple more coming in. What do you think about the extremely large amount of pathologies present in Ot 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 Otodus? Obliquus uh, in the Moroccan well, material. This is, I think, a, well, first of all, I've seen some research, it's, I don't think it was published, but uh, I've seen anecdotal knowledge that pathologies increase with size um, of a shark, um, which is just due because, I mean, if you're making a bigger tooth, there's more chances for things to go wrong. Pathologies are deformities, by the way, it can be caused by injury or disease or genetic problems. We see, if you go online and try to buy fossils, you'll first of all see a ton of otodus because in Morocco they have this phosphate mine where they have hundreds of thousands come up each year um, because sharks, of course, lose a ton of teeth every year. Um, and what you see a lot of is these pathological, pathological otodus, um, which are all bent into weird shapes and whatever. I think this is a result of collection bias mostly. 
uh, because we have these thousands and thousands of teeth from this one location, we're bound to see anything which is even a small percentage of teeth, we're gonna see a ton of. Um, and these sharks were obviously living pretty rough lifestyles, you know. They sometimes were going after like stingrays and stuff, which could, you know, potentially jab them in the mouth. You have scar tissue, a whole line of teeth is gonna be formed incorrectly for the rest of the shark's life. Uh, so that's why I think they're common. It's because we have a ton of them, um, because they live rough lives, and because they're slightly larger than their um, relatives. Mason, Shelley wants to know why uh, the pelagic teeth could not be found when diving for shark teeth like off of the North Carolina coast. Well, the problem we have plate tectonics uh, is it continually creates new land and old land is of course continually worn away. Uh, so even in those continental shelves, you're going to have, they're only going to come out to a certain time period. I think there's nothing older in our oceans than Cretaceous. Uh, I'm not sure if that's 100% correct, but I think that's what it is. All the underwater land has been replaced since the Cretaceous. Um, and pelagic sharks are going to be out in the middle of the ocean near these fault zones and stuff for a majority of their time. Um, so they're going to lose a lot more teeth out in the ocean instead of right near land. Even when you're diving offshore, uh, that's the, first of all, that stuff's going to be much higher back in the, in the Miocene or, or whatever age it is. Um, and it's not really all the way out to the pelagic uh, time, uh, space. So although I might say that there are some localities where you do have more, I think you do find slightly more pelagic species like Perototus um, in, when you're diving offshore. I know you definitely find them. There's some islands like out in the Atlantic and definitely Australia and New Zealand where we find a much higher percentage of pelagic sharks um, than we otherwise would. So yeah, that's, that's the reason. It's just, they weren't formed in the right place at the right time. And David is interested um, to, to know if, is it believed that juvenile megalodons had cusplets in order to eat smaller prey during their development and lost them over their lifetime as they grow and began to pursue larger prey such as cetaceans? I think, so in, in biology, we have adaptations, which are they serve a certain purpose. Um, and of course the shark isn't choosing this, but it's just what happens to happen because they happen to reproduce, it's natural selection. But we also have things called exaptations, which are kind of uh, happy accidents, if you will, um, in, uh, the, in, in evolution. So almost all sharks which had cusps and start to lose them, again, great whites is the same way. Uh, when they're first born, uh, they have a lot of those pedomorphic or uh, childlike, juvenile-like adaptations. I mean, if you look at, you know, a human fetus in the womb, it has like a tail and it has gills. It has a lot of the things that you'd expect from our ancestors millions and millions of years ago. So I think perhaps it wasn't, that's not what it's evolved for, but I think perhaps it could help um, definitely with the smaller, with the neonate mix. But we also got to remember, these are incredibly massive sharks. So these things are going to be, first of all, live birth. These are going to be born live in the ocean. Um, and they're going to be on the order of 16, 20 feet long, which is incredible for a shark. We don't have any um, predatory sharks of that size nowadays. Uh, we have the largest great white sharks of all time was about 20 feet. Um, so these things are basically being born at the size of a great white is. So. Wow, that's kind of scary. Yes. Um, Chase is wondering your opinion on um, pytomorphism in the Otodus lineage, the Megalodon lineage. Well, I just kind of talked about that. That's kind of what's going on is you're- Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're seeing, well, no, I'm not sure maybe Chase has another meaning that I, I, I'm just not comprehending at this moment. Uh, as I also said, they look, Juvenile Otodus obliquus look a lot like Cretolamna. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that it definitely happens. I think it happens in juveniles of every species. Um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Roberto is interested if there's any shark teeth in New Mexico. Yes, there definitely are shark teeth in uh, New Mexico, um, Uncle Bobby. Uh, uh, 
but they are, when you're fossil hunting, you have to be very cognizant of the laws in your, er uh, in your area and also whether you're on public or private land and whether you're trespassing. Um, it's hard to get to the sites, um, but sharks are actually extremely well represented in, in New Mexico. They're known from uh, all the way back in the Carboniferous period, uh, which is some 200 million years ago in the Grand Canyon area. Uh, there's lots of these, they're, they're kind of the first sharks. They don't really look like the ones we see today and they're much smaller, but they're found there. And then we have uh, all the way up to the Cretaceous, there was a, um, they call it the uh, interior seaway, the Western interior seaway. The whole middle of the United States was a shallow sea. So we find a lot of Cretaceous teeth there, um, like Tychodus, which is a, um, a, sh a shelled animal, a mollusk animal eating shark, which has these uh, battery teeth that crush them. Um, and we have things like crow sharks, the squalocorax, and Cretodus, a lot of things that look like Cretolamna, including Cretolamna itself. All right, are there any more questions for Mason at this point? Mason, you want to stop sharing your screen for a sec? Of course. Let me see. Stop sharing. Stopped yet? No. Oh, here we go. Well, I'm sh that was uh, fascinating, and I'm sure I speak for everybody. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and I do want to let folks know that there are few spaces left in the upcoming fossil trip to Stratford Hall on September 20th. Uh, you can find information about that on our website. You will also have the opportunity to learn more from Mason on September 17th, which is a Thursday evening, when he will be our expert for our Thursday night Zoom session on fossil uh, hunting uh, in Maryland, how to get started, what, where to go, um, Mason, you want to tell us what we're, what, what we're in store for? Yeah, so if this was a little too complicated for you, a little too much information, a little above your head, um, this is going to be something where you'll learn, first of all, what a fossil is. Um, you're going to learn where to find them in Maryland. I'm specifically going to go through all the time periods in Maryland and the typical things you're going to find. I'm going to teach you how to look for fossils. Um, and it should be uh, a fun, I think it should be a fun time uh, for people of any type. If you are already well versed in fossils, it's good to come to just so you can see what we have in Maryland. We actually have almost every time period represented in Maryland. And if you know of folks who are interested in all ages, all backgrounds, who are interested in fossils and getting started in uh, fossil hunting, um, please let them know, share this information with them, and they can register to join us uh, on the 17th to learn there. And the next, uh, Peter wants to know, it was se September 17th is when Mason will be doing his introduction to fossils and fossil hunting in Maryland. Nicholas uh, wants to know, will this include Western Maryland, Mason? Yes, it will. It definitely, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm probably not going to be naming too many specific sites except for in, in Eastern Maryland, um, where there's a lot of public sites but I'll be telling you how to find your sites um, and I will be talking about Western Maryland. Oh, we, I'm sorry, we have a couple more questions. In the recent notion to reassign all Carcolocles species to Otodus due to a lumper perspective? In the beginning, yes. In the now, not as much. Uh, there's a thing called phylogenetics. Uh, as, as you can see, Chase has kind of uh, gone on there. It's the whole different kind of level of looking at the tree of life. And it has to do with how species split off and there's things called paraphiles and polyphiles. So if you draw a cladogram of what's related to which, where you can draw the lines. Um, and the argument is that if we, it's kind of hypocritical to call it Carcharicles when we call other things not, or when we call other things Otodus. Um, and so that's that's the reason for that. I'm, I didn't get too much into it because it's pretty complicated and even I have a very uh, quick understand, a very uh, 
uh, elementary understanding of it. Um, but yeah. And once again, if you enjoyed this and want to get more into fossils, we totally recommend that you uh, join the Natural History Society of Maryland and become a member of the Fossil Club. There's also a, a, a dedicated Facebook group for the members for to share information and knowledge on a, 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 a specialized platform in that form. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording right now.